Matthew, congratulations on this fantastic film. Thank you so much for bringing it to the festival. Well, it's a joy to have finally had an audience to see it. So. And uh, speaking of the audience, uh, we are going to be coming to you for questions eventually. I'm going to start things off here, but please uh, do start thinking about any questions you might want to ask Matthew while, while we're here. And um, I promise I will check in with you in just a little bit. Um, just to begin at the beginning, if you will. Yep. I'll have to keep an eye on that. Uh, I'm always curious about how a project does get started. And um, we know there's a play by Marc Saint Germain. Germain. Um, but I'm curious, um, you, you became aware of the play, but what was your awareness of Freud and Lewis? Not so much the work, although please speak to that as well, but, but, the, but the biography, the personal lives, which is, I think, you know, where we are with your film. Sure. Um, well, I should first disclose that I'm the son of a psychiatrist, so... Um. <laughs> We're starting right off with the confessions. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I... I think Freud was kind of omnipresent in my growing up, and I knew of Freud. Uh, it wasn't until later I had, I had done some reading with Freud, and um, just at a basic level. Um, I think he's such a big figure in, in Western culture, really. I mean, he's as the founder of psychoanalysis. So, sorry, feedback here. Um, I, I guess that would be my understanding of Freud, um, just as uh, he was somebody that my dad used to say, um, and even recently said, he was somebody that was always challenging himself and was incredibly intellectually curious. So uh, I love the idea with this play that he would invite somebody in for discussion um, and debate on something um, that he clearly didn't believe in, but he wanted to challenge himself in those notions. And my, you know, in talking with my dad about him, I, I think this idea came that like if Freud was alive today, his ideas would seem prehistoric to him even probably. And he would just be right out there looking for new ideas and challenging them. So he was never afraid to say he was wrong and, and, and try a new idea. Um, as for C.S. Lewis, I mean, I just grew up as a kid reading Chronicles of Narnia and um, you know Prince Caspian and I, I had no idea that it had religious connotations or um, anything like that. Um, and then later, I guess I had seen Shadowlands um, that Anthony Hopkins played C.S. Lewis. Um, and actually, funny enough, in this, um, you know, for him to play Freud in this, um, Matthew Good actually wore his blue suit and his, um, his sweater was an homage to Hopkins in, in Shadowlands. Um, so, the, you know, I guess later in life I learned more about Lewis and the Inklings and the, um, the Christianity. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then uh, to just sort of stay with that, how did you, um, everything that you just explained, but how did you uh, translate into that, all of that into your direction of, the, of your two leads and what you wanted from them and the balance between the great works, what, you know, the, the professional work, but the personal life? And yeah, I think, I think that the um, Freud and Lewis to me were always just vehicles for, uh, the, for the debate and who those, those men were. So we, weren't, we were not making a biopic at all. So when I talked to the actors about the different roles, it was more about who these people were personally and what were their problems on a personal level and what were they contending with. Because you had a, a sort of a, um, a, a philosophical, um, intellectual arc to the argument. But then within this, you also had the arc of these characters personally, whether it was um, whether it was Freud dealing with his difficult relationship with his daughter and um, wanting to come to terms with that, or whether it was C.S. Lewis um, and his relationship with uh, his PTSD and also Janie Moore. Yeah. Um, so th those were the things that we would focus more on, I would say, the personal. I mean, for Hopkins, it was, it was um, extraordinary because he, you know, he's towards the latter part of his life and he's looking He's looking at death on a personal level, and um, you know, hopefully not for many years to come. But um, you know, he's 80, 85 years old, so he, it's something he thinks about, and he was um, bringing to bear all of that into this role. So we talked a lot about um, uh, trying trying to see this as a, a story as well about a man who's on the verge of death, and and how that is, and 
you know, somebody who's a non-believer who, you know, is intellectually curious, he would love to be wrong. <laughs> so um, he would have loved to have Lewis come in there and change his mind and feel like everything was going to be all right. But that sometimes isn't the case. So. Right. And uh, on, as far as Matthew Good, uh, really terrific work from him and a little bit different casting than I think we've seen him in so far. Anything to share about? I mean, he's just was a joy to work with. Um, Matthew... I've said it a few times, he's, a, he's just an incredible listener. And when we talked about his approach to C.S. Lewis and it was really about trying to really just be present and stay in the moment. And I think that was, Matthew's so fast and he's so smart and um, it was a lot for him to kind of just slow down and stay that way. And, and what he did was just incredible because I feel like you can see the other side of the dialogue written through his expression constantly and he's just, I think it's the, one of the hardest things to do in acting is to really listen and be present. So he did wonderful work. And just to stay with the cast for a, a bit, um, you know, whatever I knew about Freud's work and C.S. Lewis's work going in, I did not know about the relationship with Janie Moore in the case of uh, Lewis um, yeah. and Anna Freud, not much more. Uh, but you, there's so much rich material there. Um, is that in the play as well, or is that expanded I mean, upon here? I, this was much more. It was expanded much more here over the development of the script. Um, history has a funny way sometimes of um, hiding certain things that um, you know. So, I think the relationship with Janie Moore. I think people wanted C.S. Lewis to be presented a certain way, historically speaking, and um, it's only recently more that she's even become. Um, really thought about. Um, and I think, how do you have a relationship with somebody for 40 years and, and not consider them to be a very strong influence on your life? Right. So um, it's nice to, it was nice to explore that. And with Anna and Dorothy, um, you know, that's, a, that's something that history also, you know, I w we did some work with the, um, with the Freud Museum in London, and I was recently talking with them about it, and it's just, it, it's something that now is part of the discussion pretty openly about it, and, um, but it wasn't in the past, because you'd rather just keep people in boxes, so I, how do you understand Freud without understanding that relationship? I don't know, so. Um, just to uh, run with something you said there, the, the world that we see on screen um, is so, um, richly realized, and I don't, you know the the Hampstead home where, where Freud is at this point in his life, and is now the Freud Museum, which you just mentioned. But that's not what we're seeing. Um, this is all a set that was. Yeah, it was. Um, we we built a, a set in Ardmore Studio um, outside Dublin, and it was it was really interesting because it was um, Hopkins had done his first film, A Lion in Winter, there 50 years ago, so. This was him returning after 50 years to the same stage, and I was there the day he walked in. And he's looking around, and you can just see a lifetime, you know, passing through his eyes as he he came back there um, to do this film, looking back at his life. So, I was, what was your question? Sorry, wait. <laughs> I don't, I don't. Oh, the the studio. So yeah, we built the studio there, and I worked with um, Luciana Rigi, who's a fabulous production designer, um, who's also a bit older. Um, she had done a movie with Hopkins, um, Howard's End, and um, she had done Remains of the Day. Fabulous, fabulous production designer, more energy than anybody, just a, an amazing, inspiring person. And um, it was really fun because Lucci and, and Hopkins hadn't seen each other in about as many years as well. So I mean, it's so many threads yeah, with Anthony really. Hopkins' career <laughs> yeah. being pulled together here there in this was movie. A lot. And then in addition to the production design and creating the world that we, we see on screen, um, the score is tremendous. And, yeah, and well, where are you, Kobe? <laughs> I didn't call you out earlier. He's somewhere here. Some, um, Kobe Brown. Kobe Brown. I, don't know, I, can't, I can't see anything. But uh, so Kobe worked with me on my last film, um, and then he, he graciously came on board this film. Um, and it was interesting because... Um, we used actually very little score in the film when you think about it. Um, it's just because it's, how do you underscore scenes where the acting's so good? It's like, you don't wanna, you just don't want to. So, um, but what Kobe did that really surprised me, and I, I should also say we're brothers, um, so that always makes for an interesting working relationship, but <laughs> he puts up with me, but he, he had a chance, and maybe that is because we're brothers and have this relationship, but he had read the script and knew about it, and he had done some thinking on his own ahead of time, so he had, he had written a few pieces of score in advance 
um, and they really surprised Paul Tothill and myself, the editor, um, just because it wasn't sort of what we expected it to be. It had kind of a mysterious psychological, some of that score was just so interesting and we wanted the film to feel kind of unique and interesting and not, um, not sort of put in a box. And I felt like the score really helped us get out of the box. And then, and then again, Hopkins, I, I have to mention him too. He, um, <laughs> there's a credit at the end. Yeah, <laughs> there's a. So we were we were shooting the scene with um, with Janie, uh, sorry, with Anna and Dorothy on the couch, and I was holding the take for a very long time. And somebody said Jody or Liv, who are both phenomenal, I thought in the film, and they said, could you? Um, maybe do some playback music or something. And I'm thinking, okay, I'll try to figure this out. And, um, and Tony comes up to me, Hopkins comes up to me and he says, I've got this little piece of music that I wrote. And I'm thinking, what is, what is the world is this gonna be? And um, he pulls out the phone and it's a YouTube video of, a, of an orchestra in Vienna performing this crazy waltz. Um, so I was like, all right. So we hit play on it and um, we use that as playback. Um, but then when we got into the edit, something just magical happened with it, and I didn't even think we were ever going to come back to it, but it just worked for that whole end sequence for like six or seven minutes with no dialogue, and the ebbs and flows of all that just fit perfectly, so it sort of transitioned us through that whole period. But that's, Tony, that's Anthony Hopkins' music. He wrote that, which was amazing. That's fantastic. Um, so between... Between Kobe and, and Tony, we had a really interesting um, music for the film. I was really happy. That's amazing. Um, as I said, I do want to include questions from our audience. And um, please bear with us. You are funny shapes out there to us right now. I'll, I promise I'll do my best. I see a hand here. Hi. Sure. I'm going to need to repeat the question for okay. the taping. So the question had to do with direction and if there was freedom on take one and then it went from, from there to take two. Yeah, I mean, the direction, uh, I mean, when you're dealing with such fabulous actors, I think the idea that, I mean, it started well in advance of making the film. We really, we really spent a lot of time working in advance. So when we got there, when we got to the stage, um, a lot of the discussions had already happened, um, but there was always a lot of room for, you know, experimenting as well. What what we did was we had a very we had a very tight schedule, and we shot the first half of the film was all the dialogue um, between Matthew and Tony on on the studio, um, and then we went out for the second half of it for all the exteriors. So we had a super tight schedule, and we got in there. And we were doing with like six pages a day, uh, seven on some, and you have an 85-year-old actor um, who's not using an earbud and is not using cue cards, and um, it was just so impressive. And so what we did was we just created a really safe place where it was just the actors and myself, and it felt a lot like almost a stage was ours. Um, ben Smithard, had, our cinematographer, who's fantastic, had worked with Tony on a couple of other films. And we just created a safe place so we could try things and fall down and get back up. And um, it was much more collaborative than I had, I had anticipated. Um, but it was, um, it was one of the most creative, creatively generous experiences I've ever had with an actor, with, with Hopkins and, and Matthew. Um, so I, yes, we would try things different ways on different takes, for sure. Um, and we experimented, and we made all our days. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, right here in the front row. Thank you. Um, congratulations on a wonderful film. Thank, thank you very much. My confession is I'm the son of a preacher man who introduced me to C.S. Lewis when I was three years old. Oh, that's incredible. And then I went, when I toured through all the Narnia books, I went on to the spiritual uh, writings of science fiction when I got a bit older. And I wondered, you know, how much was done perhaps by the playwright first, but then by yourselves, in terms of looking through that quite huge body of work to create 
the, the, the dialogue with Freud, who's obviously the, the devil's advocate, um, that actually uh, C.S. Lewis often was for himself. And I'll just repeat the question for everyone in the back as well. Uh, the question was, how thoroughly um, were, were the works of C.S. Lewis gone through, not just Narnia, but the, but the writings on spirituality, um, for creating the movie? Well, so, so Mark St. Germain wrote this really beautiful play, uh, Freud's Last Session, and it was based on Armin, Armin Nikolai's uh, book. Um, and so he was a Harvard professor who, who did, a, um, he did a class um, that went for about 35 years, and it started out as a class that was teaching atheism um, and had Freud as its uh, subject. And then he found out that um, Freud, towards the end of his life, had this meeting with an unknown professor in Oxford Dawn. And he was thinking, I need a counterpoint for this whole thing. He said, well, what if it could be C.S. Lewis? So um, there was a tremendous amount of research from, from that that I believe Mark drew upon for help with dialogue, and then some was probably not just C.S. Lewis's words, obviously, because this is fictional. And then um, from that, uh, Mark and I developed it um, further. And, you know, you, I, I would say it's, I mean, we tried to really be true to these characters. Um, I, I did another movie, Man in New Infinity, and we had mathematicians with that film, and, you know, they can be fierce on you. <laughs> And I, I was always really proud of the fact that we stayed we stayed factually correct. And so the the caveat with this is that it is um, that this meeting may or may not ever have happened. But I think that we've been pretty true to Freud and to C.S. Lewis is, would be my answer. Um, actually, a a family member who happens to be um, in the ministries he watched it, and he commented about how, I think there was the line when um, C.S. Lewis is uh, with Janie Moore, and she says, well, what do you think about um, this whole thing, reading the Bible? And he says, well, I don't really um, think it matters what I think. And, and he laughed out loud. And I was like, what's so funny? And he's like, that's exactly C.S. Lewis in a nutshell. And it was something I didn't know, but yeah. Okay, I want to fit in at least a few more. Okay, go over over here, please. Um, hi. Uh, hi. How are you? My question is, what was the most rewarding um, experience you had making this film? And what was the most challenging experience that you had making this film? The question was, what was the most rewarding aspect of making this film? And what was the most challenging? Uh, I'll start with the, the most challenging. Get that out of the way. That, that was the 15 to... 20 days when we went outside, when we left the confines of this uh, wonderful stage that we felt so comfortable in. And, you know, um, spring in Ireland is more like winter and somewhere else. I don't know. It's, it's really, it was, it was challenging. That was really hard. And shooting a war scene in a day and a half is not easy to do. Um, but the most rewarding thing was working with these actors by far. It was, it was, I mean, when I say creatively generous, I've just, it was like you, you're standing on a cliff and you walk off it and you levitate and everyone trusts one another and then you step back on earth and you've just seen what you've created. And at the end of the day, there were often big hugs and um, it was just a really amazing experience to uh, feel like we were all creating something we thought was meaningful. And um, yeah, that was, that was pretty great. It sounds pretty great. Okay, this may be the last question, uh, so I hope someone has a good one for us. Please wave your hand. Okay, in the back. Go ahead, please. Yes. Thank you.
Just very quickly uh, recapping your own personal journey, engaging with all of the big questions that we have involved in, in your drama. Um, well, I'll start with the end of what you asked. Like, what do you hope I'll, I'll take away, or you can take away from it? And, and to me, I, I always wanted to, I started this process seven years ago on this, and I thought at the time, our country so polarized. It's just, it's just incredibly polarized, and that was seven years ago. And I thought, I want to make a film where when the lights come up at the end, that maybe people can actually have conversation. Um, yeah. That is a wonderful answer, I think. And I think our audience agrees. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this wonderful uh, screening tonight. And thank you, Matthew oh, Brown. Thank you so much. Thank you.